for it. We got, a, we got cultural people here that need to be serviced, and this guy can can wait his fucking turn. Uh, you can cut that music. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to Con Artist Collective today to hear the Suck Lecture, tentatively titled Art Actualization Through Creative Action Figure Bootlegging. Before we get into this discussion, I'd just like to say thank you for Con Artist for putting up with this affair and getting the blues and letting me use their wall. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Sailor Jerry Rum, who is apparently now sponsoring <laughs> this event. Um, you also may notice that there are a few cameras set up around the room. This is being captured for posterity. And so if you don't want to be on camera, you either got to put a bag over your head and get the fuck out. There's no refunds. This needs to be recorded because I need to take the show on the road and sell. So you guys are really here just to stand in as glorified props as I do this uh, demo tape for really important audiences that are going to be paying me to do this later on in the future. So before we launch into the actual discussion, who here knows who the suck lord is? Anybody? Okay, anybody not know what the fuck is going on here? You just came in off the street, you have no idea what the fuck you're in for. Okay, because this is going to be an exhaustive analysis about Suckadelic, myself the Suck Lord, and how I came to do what I do and why. And it's going to be extremely interesting and informative because I'm a very important individual and you're going to walk out of here feeling very happy you attended this event, okay? Cool. Alright, so we have a lot of material to cover, so let's get into it. Shout out to Apple TV for the technology. <laughs> um, this is what I'm most famous for. I wouldn't necessarily call myself an artist because it's a bit pretentious, but I'm considered to be the godfather of action figure toy bootleggings. This is my most famous signature item, the gay empire figure, which is an unlicensed inversion of a Star Wars character that was self-manufactured by myself and sold on the streets of Chinatown, New York to great acclaim. I continued with this line of bootleg handmade action figures. They're made out of casting resin and there's going to be an exhaustive explanation of how these are manufactured in the uh, body of the text here. This has basically been my signature product and operation and means of expression for the last 12 years. Uh, I got famous doing this. I was featured on the cover of The Village Voice, among other things. Ooh. I sold work at Christie's. There's my uh, Gay Empire figures on the back of their 2008 pop culture catalog, which was the Soprano sale, ironically. I've shown work in fancy-ass art galleries in Japan and other places around the world. There's a little detail of that show at Gallery Target in Tokyo. And I was also on this preposterous <laughs> television <laughs> I managed to create a successful alter ego for myself, this uh, bootlegging supervillain here, and surrounded myself by like-minded individuals who I absorbed into my fantasy world and turned them all into supervillains, and we ran the toy rackets in Chinatown, New York City for over a decade. I was the coolest fucking guy in the world, I fucked all the girls, I made a zillion dollars, I had a great time, and it became a great success. It got complicated later, but basically, uh, I, I was flying high on this bootleg like, toy shit for a long time, but it wasn't always like that. Um, so I, was, I, was one of, I was one of these kids, um, the shortest kid in the class. I recognize that. Yeah, I know, that's your fault. That's your what fault. shirt is that? That's uh, a boat fat shirt. That's, that's, uh, this is in 1980 at Great Adventure, and I was one of these things. Uh, the shortest kid in the class, kind of shy, got picked on, sucked at sports. Uh, all that type of thing. So how did this little shit turn himself into this fucking cool guy? <laughs> well, that's a little bit of what this whole uh, lesson is about. Just a little background. Uh, I'm from New York City, uh, and I'm, I was born in 69 and grew up in the 70s, and this is sort of the the background of my early development. You see the World Trade Center. And um, all this really cool, exciting shit was happening in New York City, which uh, doesn't happen anymore. But even though there was all this cool graffiti art, punk rock, breakdancing shit going on. My growing up looked a little bit more like this. <laughs> this was a little bit more uh, what, what I was doing during the time. These were my chief occupations, Dungeons and Dragons. I was, like I said, I was one of those type of kids, but nevertheless, growing up in the dirty old New York of the 70s had an indelible impression on my work, as we'll see as the lecture continues. Here I am in 1969 watching the moon landing. I consider this to be a historical 
uh, demarcation point. If anyone watches Mad Men, there was that they covered this, and uh, one of the old people died right after this happened. And I think in that show they definitely consider this to be uh, a generational turning point. And it also gave me the belief to reach for the stars. <laughs> so I just, I just to give a little context of what sort of what planet I was grown up on. And this was my chief interest when I was a young child was uh, toys. These here I am with my Fisher Price little people, and I, I had wonderful parents, and they bought me everything. And this was my sort of uh, refuge from the world. Uh, I was also very much into the Osmond Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why this is relevant. Because this is this is this is when I was a little child. This was my favorite thing in the world. I was playing with toys and I, uh, fancying myself to be a bit of a rock and roll. And the other thing I was really into was these Fisher Price Little People. I was so into the Osmonds and so into the Little People, and there were no Osmond toys at the time, so with the intrepid assistance of my long-suffering mother, we created uh, my very first custom figure. This was in about 1973. We took the Little People and we turned them into the Osmond Brothers. That's Alan Wayne, Meryl J, and Jimmy, and they're all painted in their, fa their favorite colors, and we knew what their colors were from reading like Tiger Beat magazine. And this was my first attempt to use toys and action figures to bring about something that I desired to see in the world that did not exist <coughs> on its own. And this became the template for how I managed to deal with the world. A little more background, these are some of my other earlier influences, the wacky packages, everyone know what the wacky packages Woo! are. These are just little stickers that spoofed products, and this was like, about when I was four or five, this was my first sort of encounter with satire or parody. And, you know, I just like always thought it was interesting how these products, which just work very hard to unironically extol their merits and virtues, can just be subverted like this. And this just gave me a certain way of looking at the world and not really trusting anything and thinking that everything around is subject for lampooning. This, of course, was also another major influence in my life. And this. Oh, what are these? Um, nipple clamps. <laughs> another, another element. Um, after my wonderful parents got divorced, even though they're good friends now, as you can see, evidenced by them sitting there together and not killing each other, uh, my mother needed to make money after she broke up with my father, and it just so happened that she stumbled upon this um, subculture that was very much in need of high-quality high nipple torture devices. And so with the help of my father, who has a strong engineering background, they were able to create um, the world's top-selling uh, nipple clamps uh, under the under the banner of a company called Tit Torture. Now, why this is important? This is important not only because uh, it sort of legitimized and sort of introduced me to um, uh, the acceptance of sexual deviancy, but it was my first experience in uh, witnessing firsthand and even working for a little bit uh, do-it-yourself cottage industry. This was uh, an entrepreneur just would go down to Canal Street and buy random bits of whatever, chain and clamps and little rubber things, and take them back to the shop in Brooklyn Heights and assemble these, um, these nipple torture devices and then market them and sold them through the mail. And supported yeah, my and, son. And, and, and made money on this. And this, this, this was, you know how many Millennium Falcons this fucking thing was? <laughs> and, um, and this was my sort of first exposure to the, to the do-it-yourself entrepreneurial, entrepreneurialism. But all of this primordial soup was just sort of sitting there and it needed some sort of bolt of lightning to activate it. And then along comes this. Now, we all know what this is, right? And I don't have to go into great detail about why this is a culturally important thing because there's been many books written about it. But for me, as an eight-year-old child, when this came out, this was the first time that this type of phenomenon ever existed. Now it's very commonplace and this has become part of the mass culture, but at the time it was brand new and it wiped away everything. I, I, Osmond's Who after this came out and this became my chief obsession and this was a sort of collective experience that everybody in my generation shared. But more importantly than just the uh, what the movie did to my imagination, uh, it was these things that really turned out to be the takeaway from the experience. Um, the classic Star Wars figures, and this not only the figure itself, but the packaging is significant and became the template for my work because uh, it's really, I consider this to be a, a piece of pop art just because of the, the combination of the text, the image, the, the, the figurative item, and then just the repetition. It was endless collection of these things and collecting them and playing with them and just sort of consuming this thing, be, these things became a lifestyle. And this was the original 12 figures, and it made total sense at the time 
that they would make all this, the heroes and the villains and all the principal characters, and at the time that seemed very normal, and I had these toys just like everybody else. But it wasn't until the following year when they put out series two and all the weird guys, all the cantina <laughs> aliens and all the creatures that were only on camera for like two seconds in the background, and it didn't really make sense for these things to become figures, but in my mind I think if you can make fucking butt mouth or hammerhead, you know, <laughs> who are just the insignificant characters, then pretty much anything can be a toy, because, you know, making heroes makes sense, because, you know, making something in a, into a toy is a way of elevating it, ironically, so elevating the weird, ugly shit made me start to think that uh, anything could be a toy, and I started even at around age nine, starting to see these things as, as a medium, so much so that I actually wasn't happy with just playing with the toys, I had to do something to them. So I took the Greedo figure, which was my, my favorite one, and a bar of soap, and I squashed the Greedo figure into the soap, and then I melted a green crayon on the radiator and poured it into the soap to try to make a copy of this thing. It didn't work, and I couldn't get the wax to come out of the soap, but without knowing anything about any of this shit, I was inclined to do this. And I didn't realize at age nine that I'd be doing this for the rest of my fucking life. <laughs> and, uh, you know, becoming rich and famous off of it and also <laughs> almost killing myself because I hate it so much. But, um, that was that. But, sig more significantly on the Star Wars thing, as far as how it helped me become the person I was, was this character. You, you know who this is? Boba. This is Boba Fett, right? Okay, now he was he was introduced in Empire Strikes Back in the second film, but a year before the film came out, they teased the figure. This was like a mail-away thing. If you bought all the other figures, you can mail in the fucking proofs of purchase, and you could get this guy. And I was, me and everybody else was immediately attracted to this person. He was a villain, but he wasn't working with the Empire. He was sort of like a freelancer, and he was an individual. And I really resonated to this character. And like you saw in the picture, I was a little shrimpy little nobody. And something about this guy, more than any of the other Star Wars characters, uh, spoke to me to the point where uh, we got this costume. And this is even before Empire Strikes Back came up, but the costume came out. And I, and I had my mother buy this for me. And we went and marched in the Halloween parade. I did a little customization on it. And I just felt like I fully occupied and inhabited this character. He was cool, the way he stood, the way he walked, the confidence, he didn't speak. And I found it personally transformative to, to put this on. You couldn't see who I really was in this costume. And I could sort of project whatever I wanted. And this sort of became uh, a thing for me. And for the next three years, I continued to develop this <laughs> costume, customizing it, adding my own features, making my own helmet, and all this crap from Canal Street. And this was a way for me to help escape, you know, the, the crushing nerdiness of my prepubescent years, and gave me a sort of an outlet and a, and, a, and, a, and a sort of affinity for costuming and persona and um, self-transformation. But of course, Star Wars ended. Wait, I've never seen these. <laughs> Star Wars ended around 1985, it waned and I hit puberty and I went through all the typical, uh, you know, things that any teenager would do, you know, fucking punk rocker, hippie, b-boy, whatever, I tried all these things on. And I didn't give a fuck, I just wanted to get high and I was into doing whatever and I sucked at school and with Star Wars gone, there was sort of like an absence in my life and uh, I was kind of a lazy student and I managed to grift myself into this shitty fucking college in Buffalo. And I just, I took a drawing class. I was like, I'm going to be an art major. And I took a drawing class and I failed. You know, I used to like to draw in cartoon, but I could not master the charcoal drawing or any of that shit. I just could not fucking draw and I got an F and I failed. I was like, okay, I guess I'm not going to be an art student. I guess I'm not an artist. Fuck this shit. And I, and I walked away from it and I moved, I transferred to a school in Eugene, Oregon. Started taking a lot of acid. I didn't do this as Alex Gray painting, which exemplifies what it's like to be on acid. And I investigated the psychedelic realms, and I got really into music and playing bass. And I fancied myself to be a bit of a rock star. And I didn't, I didn't make a piece of art. I didn't give a shit about anything. I just wanted to get high and play music and fuck girls and, you know, and and do all that stuff. And I grifted my way through school. I was probably three or four years into college with no major and no academic goals whatsoever and the pressure to do something to graduate, I had to pick a major, and I didn't have any ideas, all I wanted to do was make fucking Led Zeppelin 
merchandise. I was a, I was a bass player and I was a big fan of John Paul Jones and uh, I wanted to make a medallion of the John Paul Jones room and I took a jewelry class and I made this thing. That's not actually the one I made, that, that was on Etsy, but I made something like this. And, and, I, and I found that I really liked the, the, the jewelry making and the sculpture. I didn't have to draw and there was a lot of women teachers that I was able to charm and I was able to kind of bullshit my way through this program. I was like, okay, well if I don't have to draw, I guess I could go back to being an art student. And, uh, as long, and, I, and, I, and I became a sculpture major and I found that it was easy work to do without having to really learn anything or be good at anything and I was very good at grifting through the curriculum. And then as it was getting time to, uh, to graduate, I had one year to go and I took an independent study where it's basically you just work with one teacher and you get to just design whatever your curriculum was. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to come up with something really easy for myself that I know I can do and will amuse me and I wanted to do something with toys. I, I went back to the little people, and I, this, this Sesame Street set was one of, my, one of my favorite toys, and it's like, wouldn't it be funny if I did like a wacky packed version of this and did like a fuck you inversion with this? That would really blow people's minds. So I convinced the teacher to let me make this thing called the Action Crap House Playset, <laughs> which is, I guess, what you consider, I could consider the first toy I ever made. It was just like a Sculpey model that just had, you know, the crackheads upstairs and the dead body in the lobby. And they bought this and I got a fucking A I got an A in this class and I thought, okay, well this is easy. This was like around 92, 93, and it dawned on me, well fuck I can't draw, I can't paint. And if asshole painters can make prints of their paintings, why can't a sculptor make toys out of their out of their uh, out of their sculptures? So I was like, fuck Oregon and I moved back to New York and I started this company called Demented Toys. And I made all these little figures and pumped them around to all these art galleries. There was nobody making toys at the time. And I didn't know what to do with it. So I just moved to New York and I just would wander into art galleries and be like, Hey, want to show this work? And I couldn't get a fucking rested with this shit. Nobody gave, nobody gave a fuck about this. I didn't know what to do. I had no concept of how to approach the art world. And so I just said, fuck it, I'm not going to do this anymore. And. Uh, Star Wars was coming back into vogue and I needed something to do. And it was the only thing I had any expertise in at all. It's like I had no skills, no talents, no qualifications, and the only thing I really knew anything about was Star Wars and it was coming back into vogue. This was around 96, 97. The, uh, the new movies were coming out and everybody, suddenly being into Star Wars wasn't some sort of nerdy, uh, you know, Albatross, it was actually had some sort of uh, hipster credibility, so it's okay, I'm gonna fucking milk that thing. So I just sampled a bunch of shit from Star Wars and mixed it with all these fucking rap beats, made this little demo tape, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna get this to George Lucas, you know, and he's gonna love this, and he's gonna fucking take me on, and, and they're gonna fucking pay me a million dollars because I'm a brilliant genius. So I did that, and they were like, get the fuck out of here. I actually managed to get people that worked for Lucasfilm and worked in the licensing department to, um, to listen to it, and I was like, this can't exist. It's cool, but like, we can't get the rights to the music you're sampling, uh, we can't use the actors' voices without paying them all these royalties, nobody's gonna like this anyway, who the fuck are you again? Uh, what the hip hop, get out of here. So I was like, ah shit, you know, I guess it was too good to just leave it alone, so I was like, okay, I'm just gonna make it myself. You know, I didn't, I worked on it for a year, it's like, it's fucking coming out. So I went and I put it on CD and I, and, I, and I, you know, I paid some publicists and I got it on college radio and it actually charted on CMJ and all the shit. And this was like the first thing I ever put out and it was marginally successful at the time. This was before the internet. So people would actually call me and leave fan mail on my beeper voicemail about how much they liked the shit. And I, you know, I was selling these at little indie record stores and, and all that, but I made it myself and I knew I just, I wasn't a music producer, so I had to justify why it didn't sound good, you know, so I, I created this term, suckadella. I was like, okay, the record sucks, you know, the quality sucks, and everything I do is so half-assed, so instead of trying to gloss that over, I'm just going to fucking own it, and I'm going to build into the aesthetic, and I created this, and it fucking worked. In order to, to promote this thing, I, re I, I revisited the Boba Fett. Except now I brought him back and I made him into a, into a hip hop guy. Had the turntable backpack and the fat laces and the gold chain. This became important because I wasn't going to go out into the world and try to sell this record as fucking Morgan Phillips. You know, I had, to, I had to come up with something hot as an avatar. So this once again became like an integral part of how, um, how I presented myself to the world, wearing a Boba Fett mask. And they fucking 
ate it up and I got into Star Wars Insider Magazine. We would walk around at the conventions like Comic Con and blast the music out of the radio and sell it out of the fucking trunk. And I fucking made money off that record for a long ass time until The Phantom Menace came out. And once again, the bottom dropped out of the Star Wars market and I was out of a job. And it was right around this time I saw this thing, the fucking future appointment. And I was like, wow, you know, this is like a toy by an artist. And I'd never seen this before. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it. See, I told you. This is a thing. This is a thing. And I, and I knew these people. I was hanging out on the Lower East Side. And um, there was little stores like Recon. And all this stuff started coming out of Asia. The Michael Lau stuff, uh, Bounty Hunter. And then Cause was doing shit. And uh, 360 Toy Group. This was a toy, the first uh, designer toy store that opened in New York City and I was friendly with all these guys and I was still dabbling with toys in the background so I was like okay this is it I made it like the industry arrived that was made for me so all I have to do is be like here I am guys and and then they would take me in and I'd be and I'd rise to the top and I'd be a superstar and it didn't happen I mean these guys were making all these cool like hip-hop clean hip-hop street culture fashiony things and I was humping around these little lumpy Star Wars guys. And uh, <clears throat> nobody was interested in this. And I could not get a deal. And like year after year after year, this industry started developing around me. And nobody wanted to make my fucking toys. You know, you had, you still, I mean, these were still independently made things, but you still had to make them in China. It still cost a lot of money, and you still had somebody to support you in this, and nobody fucking wanted it. So I started getting pissed off. And then finally, this company came around. Kid Robot. This is where a lot of people started to consider the first wave of designer toys to have jumped the shark. You know, this was like an American company that was kind of like blowing it out, and the exclusiveness of it was taken away. And I was like, I don't give a shit about those guys. Y'all turn me down. I'm gonna go to Kid Robot. You know, they were making fucking dummies of every fucking asshole in the universe that had, any of this, that had a little character or wrote graffiti or did anything was getting a fucking toy made. And I went to Kid Robot with some ideas and some concepts, and they were like, haha, no. And I was like, all right, fine. Then I started really feeling mad and isolated and like getting dark about it, you know, and just getting mad and just like feeling really rejected. And um, I was like, okay, fine, fine. Like, I guess I'm just going to have to do this shit myself. And I had no money, I had no resources. So this is the best I could come up with. <clears throat> I made this thing called the Suck Lord 66, which is basically just a shitty resin cast uh, Boba Fett helmet on a Count Dooku body <laughs> and I actually made this and I was working for Hasbro at the time doing grunt work at their toy fair so I made this like in the workshop you know on the clock getting paid by Hasbro and while no one's looking I'm pouring resin I'm making these little fuck you figures <laughs> I'm like fuck you and fuck everybody and I'm like some Doctor Doom shit it's like if you I'm just I was just all, I was all about revenge and it's like you don't you don't you got all that cute pretty shit I'm gonna make something ugly and I wrote you're an asshole for buying this on the back <laughs> and, and, I, and I took it to the streets and surprisingly uh, people bought it and I was like okay that's interesting and I guess this suck lord guy is a thing now. It's like I, I retreated, I, I had to create something, some mythology around this guy, and I was very attracted to Chinatown at the time because this is when uh, gentrification in New York was, was really kicking in, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go down to Chinatown, get away from all of that, I'm gonna burrow underground, and I'm gonna fucking be this mysterious character that sells bootleg toys out of the basement, and I felt like since everything I was doing was so illegal or just fake, I felt an affinity toward the, the bootlegging scene in Chinatown and that became that became part of the mythology. And then I just brought back that hip hop thing and just sort of revamped the uh, the, the Boba Fett costume into the Suck Lord and then and then here it is. This is a thing. This is a this is a thing in the world now. And people fell for it. And I was like, okay, well I guess I gotta make another figure. And I was like, what what's cool after Boba Fett from Star Wars that I could rip off? And I was like, duh, the stormtrooper is the next cool thing. And like, what, what can I do to a stormtrooper to make it different? Uh, I'll change the color and I'll make it pink, because that would be weird. And then I was like, well, why is it pink? Why is the stormtrooper pink? Is he gay? And I'm like, yes, he's gay. <laughs> and then I made this. I made the gay empire. And I produced these things in this little shithole on Broadway and Walker Street. And Frank Kozik blogged about it on the Kid Robot boards. And a famous toy distributor hit me up and was like, I'll take, I'll take everything you have, you know. 
And I started selling these things to this distributor in LA that started putting into stores. I'm like, fuck, I guess this is a business now. I better, I better start doing, doing this shit. So uh, I really immersed myself in the mold craft. And these were, I, I was like, these were all handmade things. I would go down to the complete sculptor and I'd buy the casting resin and the silicone and just start pumping out these fucking figures. And I, using these uh, casting resins, I would just make the toys. They, this is now. This is this is how they get made. It starts out with just like a box of broken figures, little bits of Star Wars figures, another three and three quarter ephemera, and a little kit bash model gets made. And then they get made into a mold. Pour the liquid silicone around the figure, suspended in a, a box. In this case, made out of Lego. And this is what they look like when you take the, when when they cure. And then using pigments and dyes, it gets mixed in with the casting resin and poured into the molds and then the molds go into a pressurized chamber to squeeze out all the air bubbles and then boom these things come out <laughs> and then you clean them up you paint it you make a stupid package <laughs> you splatter some paint on it and boom and then on and on and on it went and for years and years and years i worked on the shit in my little sweatshop on christie street and made thousands and thousands of these things all by hand and I continued to sell them and brand them as contraband. I would go out of my way to make the transactions as, as licit as possible. <laughs> you know, meeting people in the street and having it in a fucking bag and you know, being real sneaky and creepy about it. And people fell for it. And I would go and I would and I would do it in this costume. I would go to the comic conventions and set up at other people's tables and have some exclusive. And because I couldn't paint or draw I had to do something, so I would do these spectacles where I would just splatter paint on it or just make some sort of, you know, big show out of doing something when I wasn't really doing jack shit. And, you know, I would have pretty girls hanging out in the booth doing stuff. And, uh, you know, whatever. I put on a nice little performance. And look at all these fucking mooks. And, we'll just run up and eat this shit up. People would just fucking pay for this stuff. And they were eating out of my hand. And I fucking got paid. I'd fucking go to Comic Con and come back with a fucking knot of $5,000 in cash and fucking bald hard as fuck. And I could have conceivably gone forever to this. But I got cast on this stupid fucking reality show. And uh, I got cast on this show called Work of Art, the next, you win? Great, next great artist. Conned my way onto this TV show. And I was just gonna use it as a platform to promote my work and sell more shit and just expand my uh, expand my reach and my influence. And somehow it just didn't exactly go that way, or at least for myself. Nobody else realized that I had a total mental breakdown over this experience, but for some reason I just was making shitty work. Like we had these really interesting challenges on the show and uh, you know, take this shitty kitschy painting and make it better and I wound up making it more kitschy and I was like constantly on the threat of getting kicked off the show, but the judges fucking hated me. Jerry Saltz, famous art critic Jerry Saltz, was a, was a judge on the show, and they all hated me. And I didn't really give them great work, and Jerry Saltz was pissed off because all the girls liked me and not him. And uh, what, whatever, I just was not connecting with the judges at all. They hated my shtick and they hated me, and uh, I couldn't get a break. But I was still able to control the narrative until the fourth episode, the they throw this kid at me. The challenge was they had these kids from a, from a, 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 like a, a art school or something, and they would bring a piece of artwork in, and then you had to take their artwork and do your own version of it. And I'm like, come on, dude. You know, it's like this girl painted this cool picture of a tree, and I was going to make a sculpture of the tree, and I put all these little Star Wars characters in it. But I, it, it fucked me up, you know. It, it broke me down because I started to get worried. It's like I realized, like, if I fuck this challenge up uh, and lose, this girl might feel shitty about her work, you know. And it's just like, and then, and then, and then that's when I started to crumble and I forgot what I was doing. And then all these weird, uh, sort of submerged parental instincts that I didn't know I had just came out. And I was like, just like I gotta make something really awesome, or this girl is gonna get a complex, you know, about her work. I don't know if that was true or not, but that's what I. That's what I felt, so I made this giant thing and I put all these fucking Star Wars figures on it. Everybody would do a drawing and meanwhile I'm trying to make this big fucking construction project and cutting foam and laminating and it was, I, I, I didn't budget my time well. And I handed in this turkey and then the pivotal <laughs> failure of this challenge was I went up on the bottom and Jerry Saltz told me, 
stop the Star, stop Wars. The Star Wars. It's like, we, are, we do not want to see any Star Wars in anything else you do or we're going to kick you off the show. <laughs> and that was, that, I could have said at that point, fuck you, this is what I do, and if you don't like it, too bad. But he hit an Achilles heel for me because as an artist that does appropriation, I'm constantly asking myself, am I anything without the things I'm ripping off? Am I, am I really successful only because I'm using Star Wars? And if I didn't have that, what would I be? So he got me there and I was like, okay, I'm going to show these fuckers that I don't need to do that to make good work. And I couldn't. I couldn't get it, I couldn't get it together and I kept winding up on the bottom. And, I, and, I, and they, they fed me too much alcohol and didn't let me sleep and I started to fall apart. And then the street art challenge came along. You oh, had to do some like, street art. It's like top 10 saddest anime deaths. Yeah. I, I just, I, I was out of gas. And, and everyone was, this was supposed to be like game six where he turns it around and everybody was rooting for me to succeed. And for, and for whatever reason, I got partnered with somebody else and I just, I was bereft of ideas. I was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't come up with anything and we made this dumb thing. I don't know what, I don't even know what we were doing here. You can see that there's like, there's three dimensional elements on here and it's supposed to be like a maze or whatever. It was just, it was bad, it was crappy. And we went over these graffiti tags and like, uh, Lee Quinones, the famous graffiti, old school graffiti artist, was the guest judge. And I knew I was going to be on the bottom here, and I was fucking dead tired by the time we got to the elimination. I, but I had some bullshit. Every time I was on the bottom, I had a perfect bullshit explanation to justify my mediocre work. And he came out, and the first thing he said to me is like, Yo, why'd you go over that tag? And I'm like, oh no. You know, I had no answer for that. You know, and I was just like, fuck. All my street cred just went out the window. You know, fucking cool New York City guy. You know, got kicked off the show by fucking making toy graffiti, and a famous graffiti legend, you know, humiliated me on national television. And uh, that actually never made the edit uh, um, in the show, thank God. But I was like, I was over. I could, I, it, I, I felt like the entire personality and the persona that I had created uh, was destroyed. And you know, it can't, you know, and I, and I couldn't, I couldn't get it back. I went back to my practice and I went back to my life, but I, I couldn't muster. I couldn't bring back the attitude. My response to getting kicked off the show was making this figure called Jerk of Art the world's worst artist, because I, you know, I felt like I'd failed. And I revealed my true name, and the figure was basically me standing there in my underwear, humiliated, with the Suck Lord helmet knocked off of my head. And that's, that's where I was at. I felt like I just can't pull this off anymore. And, uh, and, and, it, and it sort of ended that aspect of the work, which was actually a blessing because I was able then to just stop making work about myself. Like all that, all that prior work, all those other bootlegs were me attempting to express something and build myself up. And with the focus being off myself, I could just play around and I can do all kinds of other fun things. And just the goal suddenly became not so much about talking about myself, but just sort of demonstrating what toys can be and what they can do and trying to push it into weird spaces. I got my revenge on Jerry Saltz, <laughs> I made an MCA tribute figure, I started screwing around with celebrities and hip hop stuff, politics, this is the Chris Christie figure where after, uh, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, he, he turns into this raging blue Democrat whenever he needs uh, <laughs> Of money from the federal government, and uh, you know, and then uh, I played with scale. That's my leg. That's your legs. I started just saying, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna push this in all different directions," and started screwing around with presentations, just fucking around, <laughs> trying to just do do as take the toys. I got. I revisited the S and M concept from my uh, from my childhood. Uh, I did a little street yeah, art. Yeah. Put a couple of pieces. Somebody. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I did that. As soon as I put that up, I'm like, oh, God. The more things change, the more they stay the same. I'm, I'm stuck with myself. And, uh, but this was just a way to fucking, I've gone out with Buff a few times doing this. Right. a good time. And uh, this was just a little, just like, fuck it, I'm just going to check all the boxes. Kid Robot finally made my fucking dunny. <laughs> and I actually went back and made little suck people. I mean, visited the peg people. And once again, I was having a good time and I was starting to get my legs back in this uh, this game without having to wear the fucking helmet all the time and then I start seeing this stuff I was like fucking what the killer bootlegs who's this guy <laughs> cosmic creeps what is this you know I didn't make this <laughs> 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 
Beastly droids? Who are these fucking people? <laughs> uh, alien vs. Predator? <laughs> oh, fucking Darth <laughs> Macho, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Like, all these fucking, mm -hmm. these other people started doing this shit and taking the wind out of my sails. Pimp 2D2, <laughs> fucking Ewoking Dead, <laughs> fucking Trump Wars, give me a break. <laughs> And fucking tranny formers, peg people, it's like, give me a fucking break. All these people just came into my fucking lane. And I didn't have a response to this. You know, I couldn't really ignore it, and I didn't want to play in that same field anyway. But I was, you know, I was stuck trying to figure out how to, how to deal with this, because these people started undercutting the market and charging less and making, you know, what I can consider to be somewhat lower common denominator ideas, like yeah. this. This to me, it's funny, and these sell like crazy. They just sold them. these. They just made a third edition of these, and sold them out at Comic Con in like an hour, you know, for a hundred bucks a pop. And like, whatever your politics are, I just think this is a stupid figure because it's like Darth Vader is bad, Trump is Darth Vader, so Trump is bad, and it's like I just that was always the type of thing Wait. I was trying to avoid, you know. It's just one plus one equals two, and I always thought like. You know, one plus one equals three has always been the goal. But I had to have some response to this. And I didn't know what to do. Like, and it just, it, it raises a lot of interesting questions here because if you're doing an appropriation, if you're an appropriation artist, you know, what is, what is the thing? Like, okay, we get this. Like, it makes sense to do this, to combine the classic Warhol suit can with an R2-D2 figure. And I personally, Every person that makes this stuff has had this idea. I did my own version of, of this at one point. And then because it's just borrowing and collaging, it starts having to ask the questions like, who, where is the ownership here? You know, like, who, who oh, can either of us claim this idea and say someone thought it first? I mean, to me, it's obvious that this whole, this is a Warholian exercise. And you don't need to fucking ring the bell so hard on it. It's like clear. You know, you don't need to write Warhol on the piece. But this fucking was a huge hit. And this, my piece was a little bit more sideways. I'm not saying it's great art either, but you know, it just got, gets to the point, like who can claim anything here? And I don't think there's really any answer, but it's been, the, the process now is like, if I'm gonna continue to make this work and sell it, I have to figure out how to, how to separate myself from the hordes, because let's talk about fucking Boba Fett here. It's like everybody loved Boba Fett, and everybody makes their own fucking Boba Fett out of these toys, Hobo Fett, and then here's uh, Luke's Chew's Boba T Boba Fett. Why are so many of them like based on bad puns? That's the thing. That's I mean I don't know. That's that's what I've always tried to avoid. That's like so. It's like I get I get it. You know, Boba T and Boba Fett have the word Boba in it. So let's really call attention to that. I think Luke Chu is a great artist, but I don't think that's that successful. And then you see this shit, Star Weird, and it's a fucking Boba Fett with a boombox, and it's like, all right, all right. You know, it's like, can, I don't have an answer, but the, the question is, can one, can I claim this? Can I say this is my idea, and this person is stealing from me, and, ta and taking, taking something from me? I don't know, I don't know if I can, because it's also quite conceivable that he could have come up with this on his own. Because if you're just taking things from the ether and mashing them together, two people could conceivably come up with the same thing. And so, and, and, and there's, no, there's no answer to this, but then... Richard Prince. You gotta follow Richard Prince and stuff. Yeah, I know, but that's, they're, they're having a whole discussion about that right now, and it's like, but the thing is, that's the whole point of the piece. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about stealing and appropriation and ownership. This isn't really necessarily about that, because let's re go back to the original Sucklord character, and this is where I bring it all home, <laughs> okay? <laughs> this is by far, Looking at all these other four Boba Fett, other three Boba Fett figures, this is by far the shittiest one. <laughs> it's the most plainest and it's the most ugliest one. But I would argue that what makes this different than those other ones is that this is no longer Boba Fett. This is transformational in the sense that I've taken Boba Fett and used him as an avatar to ascribe my as my personal aspirations onto. This is a this is a piece about me trying to become something more than I truly am. This is me trying to become something beyond what I am. This is just, uh, this is just a ha-ha. <laughs> and this is a fucking life or death issue here. <laughs> it, it is, because this saved my life. This person, this character, and my pursuit of this character uh, 
allowed me to grow and become whatever the fuck I am now. And I'm going to compare it to this, okay? <laughs> now, we know, this is the, we know, you know, you know what this is, right? Yeah. Okay. It's cheap. We don't really know why, we don't really know why this person made this for sure, but I would say that this is exactly the same thing as this. Yeah. Or this. For some reason, since human beings walked the earth, there's been a drive to make an object based on what they wanted to exist in the world. This was, I'm assuming, the ideal female form. And somebody wanted this woman, or was so enamored by this shape, that they took a fucking rock and carved a totem of it and made it. I don't know what the hell they did with it. They maybe sold it to other fucking lonely cavemen or just created these things in a way to bring, bring something about. And I think that the modern toy industry and especially the indie toy industry is exactly the same thing. These are all aspirational figures that people use to elevate themselves and to bring their, their, um, to elevate um, their station in the world. And to illustrate that point, here's the crazy cat lady figure, right? This is stupid, right? <laughs> and the, the reason why I think this, this proves the point, because this is not, this is funny because there's no, this shouldn't exist. This is not, this is not an admirable person. And if by making it into a figure and making it into a punchline, you're, you're saying that action figures are larger than life and um, important aspirational ideals and that the process of doing this, playing with playing with toys and playing with Millennium Falcons is is serving not just like a superficial childish need but a, a deep rooted human instinct to use objects and use toys and small sculptural items to make themselves bigger than what they really are. So I think I've succeeded pretty much in convincing you all that I'm at least equal to uh, a masturbatory caveman. <laughs> and uh, that's, bas that's, basically what the, that's basically what the work is about. And that is what I do. So thank you for listening to my lecture. My name is the Super Suck Lord, and these are all my places and my things and all the things that I do. You can watch Toy Lords of Chinatown, you can give me money on Patreon, and sit through this type of crap every single month for only a dollar. And you can listen to my famous interview show. That's it. How was my talk? Did you like it? Is it good? Is it good? Is it good? Did the original manufacturers, did their original manufacturers of these toys ever give you problems as so far as like copyrights no. or anything like that? No, I've never gotten sued for any of this stuff. Never got a cease and desist. No, and I have a couple of theories as to why that is. Um, one, this is such rinky dink podunk shit that it's probably not worth it mm. to fucking sue me. And it's not, it, this doesn't compete. That, that's not a Boba Fett figure. If that said Star Wars Boba Fett, you know, and it was designed to trick somebody into thinking it was a real Star Wars figure, then, um, then it'd be a problem. But because there's, there, there is no gay stormtrooper that I'm competing with. And I think on some, on some level they just, they don't want to sue the guy that made the pro-gay toy because that's going to make them look like assholes. Uh, two, there's no, there, it doesn't take business away from the regular Stormtrooper toys. It's not, it's a, it's not, it's not masquerading as a Stormtrooper, so there's no competition. And I also think that on some level they like having, at least with like Star Wars, they like the, they like having this sort of vibrant fan community of mm. people pushing their work and their properties into <coughs> realms that they can't touch themselves. Like they can't make a gay Star Wars figure, but I think they probably behind behind the scenes they're happy that it exists because it's just another space that their property um, can occupy. Mm. And that's it. Oh, who, oh, who knows this? Well, I know people who have been sued. Lots of people. I know people that have got sued by HBO by making it because the guy made like a Kenny Powers figure from Eastbound and Down, but it was just like Kenny Powers figure, boom. And there was no comment or there was no attempt to transform it or utilize it or move it into another space. It was just purely representational. And I think that's why that's why I continue to win at life. Because, <laughs> uh, because I don't I'm not saying that this is necessarily good artwork or not, but it's it's at least transforms the thing that it's stealing from into so, into something beyond. So um, yes. Why don't you show things on the stop? Uh, you know the subpanels. 
Uh, there was a couple of sub panels there. <laughs> yeah, but it should be pushed. They what do you mean? Tell me. I don't know. Grew. This is still in development. You know, I've only done this once, and I don't know. <laughs> sometimes while I'm in the middle of doing it, I'm like, what the fuck am I talking about? But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of sub panels here. I mean, the the idea with these things is really to these are these are actual figures that that you just buy in the store. They're not custom figures. They're not anything. It's just a stormtrooper on the Kim Kardashian thing. And you might want to ask, why the fuck did he do that? And this was in a lot of ways just a, a way for me to just assert my dominance by saying at the time, this was the most popular image in the world. You know, when this picture came out, what the fuck was this, two years ago or whatever? Definitely. It's fucking, it blew, it fucking, it, she broke it, she broke it. <laughs> so I wanted to, so what my attempt is this, like, I could, the stormtrooper has nothing to do with the picture, but the idea was, it's like, I could just, by slapping a, an unrelated Star Wars figure onto this famous image, I can own it now. Like, I, this is now a subword piece. This <laughs> image belongs to me because I put a stormtrooper on it. I don't know if that comes across, but that was what my thinking was. It doesn't, but it still made sense that it was there. Like, I didn't question it. Well, I mean, that, that was Like, that seemed like the right choice. I guess. I mean, now you put Starscream and, and, and Megatron with, with um, Kim and Kanye. Why? The robot. Mm -hmm. No, because <laughs> they're <laughs> assholes. <laughs> because they're assholes. You know, they're Decepticons. It's like, it's not, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what I was thinking, because there's no answer, but the idea with these panels in a lot of ways is just a sort of free association. This is a little bit more representational. That's just like a, a repainted G.I. Joe figure to make him look like Tupac. And then I painted Storm Shadow to be a black guy for the, the Wu-Tang thing. But the idea is just to constantly push what it can, what it can, what it can do and make a lot of money off of it. So... <laughs> Thank you for listening to my fucking talk, and you guys. Oh, I promise yeah, wait, that. We got a what? What's the question? Oh, I should I, hit this Sailor Jerry too. By the way. <laughs> I want to compliment you. I, I'm what? really impressed. I I really sort of feel like I learned a lot about you today. Especially, I like the fact that you've been doing this since you were like this big. So that's incredible. Because that's thank, a lot. Thank time, you. So. Okay, and what can I do to make it better? No, I just want to oh. know where's where are you going next? Because you have all these copycats. You've always been this trailblazer, this person that's come up with these ideas first, and you've done that. But what is next for Suckler that everyone else is going to want to copy? Uh, I'm, that's still in development, I and mean, that's one of the reasons why I chose to put this little presentation together. And it's still, it's still, it's still growing, but because uh, this is kind of ending. This this particular part of my process is is, is ending. I'm going to retire from the hand making and the and the grind in that area, and I want to sort of put a bow on that and call it closed. And then I'm trying to figure out where to go with this. I mean, there's definitely going to be more like manufacture, going to start making things in China and start trying to put things in art galleries and just trying to make more wall of the work. And I don't, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but it's, I'm getting out of this fucking sweatshop business. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I want to I wanna get out of the toy game because a, a lot of the work right now, the main audience for it is like the Comic-Con crowd or the Toy Tokyo crowd or whatever, and that's fine. They'll always be there, but it's important, I think, to sort of move it into some other spaces. Like, uh, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I don't like to call myself an artist because it's pretentious and you set yourself up for some, you know, it's, it's you can set yourself up for failure. But I guess, for lack of a better term, I think, you know, I guess it's art, or it's le it's enough like art to call it art. It's it's an art process. It looks like art um, when you're making it. And so I guess to put it into an art space, but my strategy is to sort of um, enter through the gift shop. Like, uh, I ne I, I've never had success like walking into like an art gallery and being like, hey, I'm an artist, take me seriously. So I figured, okay, these are just stupid little tchotchkes. You know, I'll put it in the, the gift shop and then sneak into the fucking, into the museum that way. I got a, some stuff in a, in a Swiss sci-fi museum. Like they're doing some Star Wars show, so I'm just gonna keep milking that shit, and then I'm gonna go become a famous Hollywood TV guy. And, uh, Bringing me along? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna start making toys in China, but I'm gonna still do fucking fuck you ironic toys, and I'm gonna do them with famous celebrities, and and just complete, and just completely sell the fuck out. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. Okay. You? What do I have to do to get a figure of me? Of you? Yeah. Listen, yeah. it took. 
you just you have to make it yourself. Okay. <laughs> you work in my studio. That's my latest intern, by the way. Uh -oh. Assistant, is, apprentice. 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 Protege, acolyte. Yeah. <laughs> Disciple. Ooh. Okay. Paint slave. <laughs> um, Thanks, you come, Dad. You come to the studio and you make it yourself. All right. Under my tutelage. Yes, Teen Meg? <laughs> you have a question? No, I just wanted attention. <laughs> okay, now, before, before, okay. Yeah. When do I get my shots? Uh, oh, yeah, I, I did promise, I did Are promise. There yeah, I promised everybody a free fucking toy. And now you're going to get it. But before. I, I close this. This is still kind of an intimate crowd. Someday I'd like to, I, I'm still developing this presentation. So, okay, I want some criticism now. What did I do wrong? What can I do better? You need clips in the part about how you were on reality TV. What do you mean clips? Like, yeah. video? If, it's, if you're talking about your TV experience, the same way that when you're talking about your art, we see the art, we need to see the TV. Okay. Like, I'd love to see the piece that you ended up, the tree that you ended up making. Yeah, you don't Like, that didn't show up, and I was really curious to see Okay, that good, that good. And you need to show yourself crying. What it was I'm not just a dude like it. You got, like for my show, like drove you did a kid bash, which was awesome. Okay. And then the Rihanna thing she did for the cat bash, which was amazing too, which was not a toy at all. It was just a sausage. <laughs> yeah, it was that? okay. Thank you. That's good. I think you should go life size and go like the Forbidden City style, which hundreds of them. Yeah. Wait. You got some financing? <laughs> you know, financing. Yeah. That's all. Exceptional, man. You know, go yeah. to the Google. You know, how to, you know how to talk to those people? Ask the new friend what he thought. What? You have to ask the new friend. What new friend? <laughs> oh, that guy, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what'd you think? Yeah. Oh, what did I think about the presentation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, great job. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, why are you not in Comic Con right now? I mean, it's Thursday. It's yeah, why are you not in San I don't do Comic Con anymore. I've, I've He's out 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 you out just drag out. <laughs> no, yeah, we did do the, dra yeah. the drag yeah. convention, which was interesting. I mean, I feel like I've already done Comic Con, and all those other jerk offs are doing Comic Con right now. There's a whole booth. There's probably right now about maybe 50 different artists that are making resin blue like toys, and there's a, a company that sells them there. So it's like all their shit is out there, and it's just like. It was just sort of a, a strategic decision not to put myself in that pool. I want to keep some distance. I mean, any one of those guys would suck my dick if I took my pants off. But <laughs> I feel like in order for me to, to, to take my work somewhere else, I can't play in that pool I'd anymore. And Comic-Con has also just become a giant clusterfuck. Have you been? You've been to San Diego? I was in San Diego yesterday. My house is rented out for Comic-Con right now. Oh, good, good for you. Have you attended a convention recently? Uh, you're from San Diego, you said? Yeah. So you've been at one point. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a Comic-Con kind of guy. Yeah. You know, not it fun. used to be great, but now it's just a giant corporate clusterfuck. Yeah. And it's so crowded and everything's so expensive and you're competing with all this noise and it's just... Uh, I did it already. You know, I don't like to go backwards, so... Fuck it. I'm not even doing New York Comic-Con. We did DragCon. That's the thing, it's to try to yeah, take, take the shit there. in places it's never been we'll before. But we did, we, I made a bunch of drag drag queen figures and sold them at the, at the drag queen. And that was, you know, it's, it's hard well, going. You know, just to, it's hard to be authentic these days because like everything's been done. And so how do you be, you know, like, how, how do you be real when, you know, you're, you're trying to, it seems like you're trying to, to retain some level of authenticity in all of this, and it's, it's not easy. I, I guess, I mean, I've, I've come to discover that I can only do what I do. And it's like, when I, I learned that lesson on the, on the TV show, it's like the art critics didn't like what I did, and instead of just sticking to my guns and saying, fuck it, this is my shit, if you don't like it, kick me off, I try to contort myself into something to please them, and came up with nothing. So it's like, I, I, I almost feel like I was forced to do this, because I tried to sell out and cop out and cash out, and do something else, and nobody wants it. You know, they, it's the only thing that people will give me money for is if I just do what comes naturally to me, and even if I don't feel like fucking doing it. And so I don't know. I don't have an. I, don't, I couldn't tell somebody how to be authentic. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm being authentic for the sake of authenticity. It's just like this is all I got, and it just so happens to be fortunate enough that people will give me money for it. But I, I don't know. You either got it, you don't care. It's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. I don't know. But that's it. All right. Yes? So when uh, like other Star Wars figures on Heavy were coming out, did you feel like that cut into your, your business? Or did you have kind of more discerning? It kind of does. Yeah, it kind of does. I mean, uh, I just feel like 
it's sort of easy to get. It's, they're easy to understand. Like you can look at something like Darth Trump and ha ha. It's like it doesn't require a lot of depth. And I was kind of gone out of my way to make shit that's deliberately confusing, or to try to make something that's contradictory, or try to make something that shouldn't be a toy, or make something that makes you feel like an idiot because you don't understand it. Or that's that's all. And then, and then that doesn't always sell. You know, as much as something that's easy and, and superficial, you know, so, but I feel like it's more important to try to do that kind of work because I think in the long run, long run, it'll probably be more rewarding personally. I might not make a zillion bucks, but I probably will. But um, <laughs> I just, I don't, I can't do the stupid puns. I've probably done a few of them. You could probably look at a bunch of my work and, and, and find examples of exactly the thing I'm criticizing, but uh, that can be your job. <laughs> All right, does anyone, yes? Uh, besides Gay Empire and uh, Suck Lord 66, what is your favorite figure? Like, you, when you look at it, like, that, that's, that's the first, shit, that's I hit it out of the park. Even, I can't even remember no, come on. anything I've ever made. Uh, like, I mean, the one that you, all right, you take it on a desert island, that's the I'm one. I'm not going to take any of this shit on a desert island, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I like the creature figure, I think is pretty cool. This Come on, you just scroll to that. No, no seriously. No, but this, this is probably what I would say is my favorite figure of everything. The creature army. And I have no idea. I just like the creature. I like the color green. And I like the idea. This was called, uh, like, it was, a, it was like a sort of a critique of war. It was just the idea. It's pretty, pretty fucking heavy-handed attempt to just say, like, that war turns people into monsters. You know, which is pretty obvious. But it was kind of a cool-looking pop, pop way of doing it. And I just like riff, I like to riff on the, the little army man yeah. sc sculpture, and just because those army men are so non-committal, you know, all all of war toys, GI Joe, everything are so, uh, you know, they, they don't actually say anything about war. So I wanted to just make one that was just like, oh, that's pretty fucked up. And it was also about the way that like once you go to war and come back and you're all fucked up, nobody wants to deal with you. That's why I called it a wrecked souls of forgotten war. But that is just attempting to be like fucking deep. Um, I don't know. These are good. The, cr the, the, yeah. the face figures. These are all the gods of the psychedelic cosmology. And I used all the Dungeons and Dragons dice's head to suggest like chaos and randomness. And Kronos was the guy that like wasted your time. And then there was a um, Sloth one and a fucking uh, hemorrhoids one. And uh, things of that nature. All right, who, anyone else got anything to say? You want your fucking toys now. Toys. 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 What? Toys. Okay, toys. all right. I just got a couple of naked girls Ooh. to come out. Uh, I can show my, hey, you need some alternate, <laughs> I'll, I'll show my ass. Like, you yeah, pee, you show okay. your ass. Why don't you take your ass out, and you can show it you know, <laughs> while I give out free toys. Okay, everybody, I'm going to be giving out today uh, to Mr. Pack figures. You get a free fucking figure just for attending. Now, these things generally retail for $5, so you got a hell of a fucking deal today, all right? You paid a dollar for this lecture, and you got a fucking $5 toy and a free drink. Did everyone take advantage of the, of the free drink? Okay, cool. All right, so don't be shy. You can approach the lectern and... Uh, and uh, and take a figure, and I'm even gonna let you pick. So come on, come on. <laughs>